this session is just to ask the question in a more broad way than we, when we've asked, what does the current tech inclusion landscape look like? Um, and the goal is really to help us understand the state of diversity and inclusion um, from the perspective both of industry and, and the academy. So we have two academics here, or yeah, we're academics, and, and two industry people. And actually, we have a great panel. So I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Um, and then I've asked them each to speak for like five minutes or so about their perspective on the state of inclusion and diversity in their domain, and then open it up to a discussion among them and hopefully with you as well. So first on my far right, I have Jason Gong, who's a diversity program specialist at Pinterest. Uh, and he's responsible for cultivating and growing Pinterest's internal employee communities and development of, and integration of a DNI learning and development curriculum. He's also responsible for managing a portfolio of strategic relationships with community and industry groups in support of Pinterest's diversity hiring goals. To my far left is Joseph, Joseph Nessingmana. Nessing, did I say, tell me how to say it. Nessingmana, sorry. Who's executive director of diversity and inclusion policy strategy and external partnership <coughs> at Intel Corporation. He's responsible for setting the strategy, policy, and external partnerships to reach diversity and inclusion commitments that Intel sets for itself. He also is responsible for implementing all pathway development initiatives funded through the $300 million diversity and technology fund that Intel established in 2015 to reach full representation of women and, and underrepresented minorities in Intel by 2020 and to prevent, uh, promote diversity in the technology and gaming sectors. Uh, to my immediate right is an old friend, <laughs> graduate student, now uh, a professor. Professor uh, Marianne Cooper is a sociologist at Clayman Institute for Gender Research and the Center for Advancement of Women's Leadership at Stanford University. She's an expert on gender, women's leadership, diversity and inclusion, uh, her, and also on financial insecurity and e economic inequality. Her book, which I um, think was her dissertation, um, it was called Cut Adrift Families in Insecure Times. And it looks at how families are coping in an insecure time. And it actually looks at families in Silicon Valley. So it's very relevant. Uh, she received her PhD in sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and last but not least, Hector Beltran is a PhD candidate in anthropology at UC Berkeley. Hector has a BS in CS and engineering from MIT. Uh, and he's doing a dissertation right now, uh, which is ethnographically investigating the circulation of emerging forms of hacking and entrepreneurship between Mexico and the San Francisco Bay Area. Sounds very interesting. Um, his research focuses broadly on the politics of race and creative economies. So I'm going to ask Jason to start. Thank you very much. I just want to say I'm, I'm so excited to be here uh, and connect with all of you. I feel woefully under-credentialed sitting up here with all these brilliant uh, brilliant minds, but uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to share more. Uh, just a quick background on kind of how I found myself in this industry and doing this work. My path is a little non-traditional relative to a lot of other folks that uh, practice DNI, uh, really on any level. Uh, this is all I've ever done in my entire career. I found this work accidentally in undergrad. I went to a small liberal arts college in central Pennsylvania called Dickinson College. At the time, it was, wow, probably almost 99% Caucasian students. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I went to the third largest high school in the country. So transplanting from, from Brooklyn to a liberal arts college that looked quite different from where I grew up, that was less than half the size of my high school, uh, was quite a shift for me. But it put me uh, in, in quite an a interesting predicament, one that would, that would really change the trajectory of my life. So I, I had a lot of really interesting experiences, I'll say, uh, with peers who uh, were from parts of the country. Uh, generally, the Mid-Atlantic is where a lot of the students that go to Dickinson are from, so Maryland and some parts of New England. And um, you know, Aside from most of the, the students uh, identifying as white or Caucasian, the biggest difference I saw was the socioeconomic gap. Right? Uh, I was going to school with students who had gone to boarding schools and prep schools and private schools, and those were all kind of foreign entities for me going to the, the public schools uh, in New York City. And so uh, what it forced me to do was encounter people that um, in many cases, their frame of reference for anyone that didn't look like them, they got literally from television and from the movies and from what they heard on the radio. And you know, that, that kind of made me realize two things. One, I could you know, leave this place 
and go someplace where there were more people like me, uh, with whom I had more in common, at least outwardly, who looked more like me, or I could try to meet these folks where they were at, right, and, and try to um, build bridges and connect the dots. And in doing that, I chose the latter, and in doing so, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my own biases, my own stereotypes that I was projecting on a lot of my classmates and peers. So when I fast forward through my four years in undergrad and, and helping to kind of pioneer a lot of the DNI work at Dickinson College, I found myself at Lehman Brothers. Um, just as the, the, the whole diversity thing was starting to gain steam. So the, the first time I ever got paid for doing this work was in 2002. And I think around that time, women accounted for just over 1% of Fortune 500 CEOs. And we fast forward 15 years, I've been doing this work 15 years, women now account for just over 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs. So not a mathematician, but I think that's something in the, in the realm of like 0.2% per year uh, over that period of time. So we've been having this diversity conversation for a long time. And so that's why for me, I, I find it somewhat challenging uh, to engage in discussions about uh, the difficulty of this work and the difficulty in moving the needle because so much time, so much energy, so many dollars, and lots of resources have been invested in this work, not just within the tech industry, which is a relative latecomer, um, by and large, but by finance and the pharma companies and professional services. And some certainly do it better than others, but by and large, we've got a long way to go. Uh, all that to say that over my career, I started in banking. Uh, they went bankrupt. I found myself at American Express, then at Prudential. <laughs> Uh, you know, financial services primarily, a little bit of time in advertising and publishing. And what I can tell you now that I've been working uh, in tech, uh, now at Pinterest and formerly at Facebook, is that the challenges are fundamentally the same. And I find that, you know, we as people, we tend to make this work much more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, I, I appreciate the, especially being in tech, I appreciate the value and the importance of using data and numbers to help build the business case and the importance of empirical data. Uh, but I also think that there's a human element to this work that uh, I think that people sometimes overlook. And the ability to connect and to build bridges. Empathy, you know, uh, an investment in empathy is something that I think a lot of companies uh, would stand to benefit from making. Um, so, you know, all that to say that um, in, in my capacity now at Pinterest, I'm focused 100% on inclusion and engagement programming. You know, my, my goal uh, is really um, figuring out how to connect the, the dots for people once they join the company, right? I mean, we spend so much time and so much money uh, recruiting and sponsoring organizations and building partnerships with companies who can help uh, supplement our pipeline with underrepresented talent and women. And that's important. That's critically important. But what happens once they come to the company? What kind of environment are they walking into? Do their managers understand how to meet their needs? Are we making sure that we're creating an environment that is really fostering belonging? Or are underrepresented people coming to the company and immediately questioning whether or not they belong there, whether or not they deserve to be there, right? I mean, I've dealt with imposter syndrome at many different points in time in my career, and none greater than when I first came into the tech industry. So it's real. It's a real experience, I know, because it's been mine. Uh, so all that to say, uh, hopefully what you all can take away uh, from this conversation is that when we think about the, the tech landscape from an inclusion perspective, um, I think that we need to continue to invest significantly in building out that human element internally and in increasing the emotional intelligence and in increasing the capacity for leaders in organizations to recognize the incredible, incredible opportunity of being able to meet people where they're at, uh, recognizing the, the value and the benefits of the different experiences they bring to the table and how they can contribute. One of the things I'm really focused on right now uh, both at Pinterest, but in conversations I have like these, uh, is we talk a lot about how difficult it is to find underrepresented engineers. But every tech company is not just all engineers. We have salespeople, we have people that work in operations, in finance, in HR. You have professionals of all sorts that are essential to running these companies. I think we need to make a much greater investment in identifying talent outside of these traditional tech pipelines. Why can't we be going to professional services organizations or people who work in banking, folks that have transferable skills, companies that historically, and, and industries that historically have much greater diversity of representation than the tech industry does, where we can be reaching out and looking to build bridges. So for me, I, I think reaching out and connecting those dots is, is key. And so that's, that's a big part of what I'm trying to do at Pinterest and hopefully what we can continue to do as an industry.
Great, thanks, Jason. Wow, <laughs> hard act to follow there. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is indeed, and and the fact that um, Jason was talking about his prior engagement in this work outside the tech sector, um, <clears throat> it's interesting to compare your experience um, in the banking sector and then your experience in the technology sector. Um, my background is in engineering, so um, I'm completely from, I mean, I did engineering in college. I worked for Intel since graduating as an engineer, um, designing microprocessor for a number of, time, a number of years. Um, and then I found myself in this work to try to uh, make sure that we actually are pre uh, preparing and making sure that we have engineers will take over when we retire. Um, <clears throat> so you'll find that my approach and that of Intel actually is really from an engineering perspective. Um, we treat this as an engineering problem. Um, you have to solve it. And in order to solve this problem, you have to understand what the problem is. You have to understand the tools that you have to be able to make the changes. You have to have enough resources to address that problem. And you have to be empowered uh, to do so. So if you look at, if you look at the, uh, the tra trajectory that Intel has taken, uh, we've been doing work in the DNI for a long, a long time. Um, I know a lot of people associate Intel DNI with the announcement that was made in 2015 uh, when our CEO, Brian Kuzinich, um, uh, made an announcement that by the year 2020, we're going to reach full representation. Uh, but it wasn't, we didn't start the work at that time. We had done some work prior to that. Um, but what was interesting at that point, it really was an inflection point in a sense, was to actually make a commitment and put a time to it. So it was, it was, it was instead of saying we're going to improve, we're going to continue to improve, he actually said by the year 2020, Intel would reach full representation. And so that's really important to have a, a, goal, a goal that you state and you time it. Um, and then he didn't just state the goal and didn't just state the five years at the time, he also committed $300 million to work towards that goal. So he made the goal, he made the resource available, and he said, go at it. So a team of, uh, uh, of uh, professionals actually looked at this problem. And the way we, we went about looking at this is that we started by looking at um, if you step outside and, and, and kind of put yourself in the, the most critical uh, people, uh, shoes and ask yourself, what are they thinking about? The first question is, why are we doing it? And I think the previous speakers touched on that. You have to make a business case to why diversity and inclusion is important. Um, and so we partnered with Dorbert and conducted a research which is actually available and you can look at it, uh, to try to understand the diversity and inclusion impact on the bottom line of the company. Um, the, the, the impact on innovation. Um, and what we found, which is validated by a number of other research, is that diverse teams perform better. Um, and diverse companies actually outperform their counterpart who are not diverse. So it makes perfect sense that you really should, should invest in this space. Secondly, is that, um, um, and the previous speaker alluded to this, is the shortage of the technology talent that's available. And actually, uh, she did mention the one million uh, um, gap uh, that um, actually is more of a projection, really, by the year 2020, we would have uh, about a million or so unfilled positions, meaning that we don't have enough people uh, to fill them. And that's taking into account those who are enrolled in school today to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, graduate and, and take up those positions. And so that is, a, that is a problem that the technology sector faces. So you cannot keep tapping into the same groups and expect that you're going to produce more than you're actually producing today. Um, and if you look at the demographic of the United States and look at what are the components that are growing the fastest, the fastest right? And how are they contributing to the talent pool? Then you really find yourself that you need to invest in those groups because that's how you're going to close the gap. Again, you make a case for, for why diversity is important uh, from that perspective. So that's the, f the first thing we did. The second thing is to look internally. Um, I think Jason talked about this, is 
The, this is not a problem that you're going to solve by just recruiting. Um, you can recruit as many as, as many people as you want, but if you don't retain them, the problem will persist. So we wanted to look at, okay, how are we doing with retention within Intel? And what are the issues that's causing that this retention is an issue in the first place? So we did a survey, internal survey, um, about 17,000 people responded to this survey to try to identify what the problems were. Um, and this was open to everybody. It wasn't just the underrepresented minority and women. It was open to all employees. And some of the, 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 some of the things that they pointed out to is um, things like lack of progression, um, things like management, the middle management issue, and all those stuff. So we had to design solutions to address those specific problems. Uh, those specific problems. The other thing was on, on recruiting. So if you always go to the same schools, that are not diverse, then you're not going to get diverse student, <laughs> right? So you have to you have to look at you got to diversify where you go to get your talent, and it's not that you're lowering you know your your quality. You're just expanding your search. Um, you have to also look at the what are the uh, methods that you're utilizing to to recruit. You, you probably you know some of the things we ended up doing is make sure that we have inclusive hiring methods. Um, have a panel that's interviewing. Make sure that panel has women and underrepresented minority on it. Uh, make sure that the slate that you're interviewing is not just homogeneous. Uh, make sure you have diverse kind of, things like that. So there is a series of, uh, of, 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 of things we have taken to be able to address this problem. But we approach it from, again, from an engineering perspective. And then we can measure how we're doing. And I'm actually glad to report that in our annual report, our media annual report uh, this year, um, we looked at how we were doing, and we actually have pulled, you know, the 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 goalposts now that we will reach full representation next year instead of 2020. So I mean, there is progress that's being made, but it's not, you know, it has to be really systematic. You have to track it. You have to. Uh, uh, you have to fund it, you have to empower it, and you have to hold people accountable. Uh, short of any of this stuff, you're not going to be successful. And one thing that I, I'm really looking forward to is, <clears throat> is actually how we connect with academia. Uh, particularly, um, if I look back in the last four or five years, the tech sector have invested over $1.2 billion in trying to address this issue of diversity and inclusion. But as an industry, we don't have a lot to show for. Um, and the challenge is that <clears throat> actually industry isn't reporting. Um, only 10% of the companies are reporting their data. And so it's important to do, it's, it, without this data, you can't do research. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do research, you cannot come up with evidence-based methods to apply, you know, and, and therefore affect the entire industry and beyond. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can come up with ways of encouraging more companies to report the data um, and then get the academia to look into that data and be able to come up with these really evidence-proven uh, uh, methods that everybody can use. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. That's a perfect transition to the academic part of our panel. Oh, there you go. First, there's an academic. There go. Um, <laughs> so I, I think your question is about what sort of the status of women in tech. Yeah. At least that's what was sent to me in the email. Um, uh, so, um, and whenever I start talking about this this issue, I'm, I'm reminded of a colleague of mine who says there, there's a lot of job security in studying gender inequality, right? <laughs> so that's like the optimistic yeah. assessment of the state of women in tech. Um, so I think we've touched on a lot of the different numbers, but I can just you know, highlight them that you know, women have been um, half of college graduates since the early 1980s, and now they're outpacing men in terms of college degrees and master's degrees. So women get like 57% of the college degrees, 60% of the master's degrees, but really not just in tech, but anytime you're looking at um, women in leadership, for example, they remain underrepresented. So 5% of CEOs of S&P 500 companies, 19% um, of Congress, a quarter of um, um, our elected officials in our state legislature. And these things have really sort of, there was upward momentum for a little bit, but since about the mid-1990s across a host of indicators, progress has really stalled out, or to the degree that there's progress, it's been super slow, so a glacial pace. Um, and I'd say from an academic perspective at this point, and the, and the last speaker 
summed up so wonderfully is we actually know what a lot of the problems are. This is not a lack of understanding. We under, one of the uh, ones that are, we focus on a lot at the Claimant Institute is uh, stereotypes and how bias inserts itself into evaluation processes um, for a lot of underrepresented groups, and this often results in disadvantaging women or other underrepresented minor minorities and advantaging men. Um, and the problem is we have much less research on interventions and how those interventions work. And part of it is this divide between academia and um, practitioners on the ground. Um, so more partnerships are important. Um, it can be hard to take a theoretical concept and operationalize it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think there's also, um, in, for, among just the general public, a fundamental misunderstanding of how complicated and systemic these problems are. And I, I, you know, I'm often asked for like a checklist as to what people can do. <laughs> and I'm like, you're asking me for a checklist to solve systematic racism and sexism. <laughs> I can't give that to you. And what it shows to me is that you're not fully mm -hmm. understanding the magnitude of the issues mm -hmm. that we're up against. Um, and not that, you know, maybe a checklist in a certain situation can be helpful, but it's really about understanding how all of these kind of social forces work to produce these outcomes. Because as any sociologist will tell you, social patterns are not accidents. Right? There are systematic forces um, and ways of interacting and evaluating people that lead to all of this. So we're doing a lot of interesting research at the Claimant Institute, working with, um, partnering with companies. Um, we had a recent partnership with GoDaddy. Um, which I'm sure you all remember from the football mm -hmm. commercials years back is not maybe the first company the Claimant Institute of Gender Research <laughs> might partner with, but they were um, uh, they had a new CEO who really prioritized and focused on this, which is why leadership matters so much. Um, and um, uh, colleagues of mine worked closely with them on their evaluation processes. And this is just an example of how to think about, well, we know that women are often held to different standards. Um, their communication style is commented on in various ways. Um, and this, is, this rests on, on the stereotype about women that should, they should be nice and friendly and warm and nurturing. Um, so when women are super direct, people will be like, she's really good at her job, she's just difficult. Right? She's not a team player. So those kinds of comments can actually, they have distinct social penalties for women in these kinds of evaluations. And so they work, my colleagues worked with the team to identify what are your criteria? What are they, what do they mean? And let's make sure everyone's aligned. Because you often find you go into companies and their criteria is like, be phenomenal. <laughs> right, and what, what any social scientist will tell you is that in ambiguous situations, that's where we're more prone to rely on these kinds of biases, right? So you can start in, um, there's many places in the employee life cycle or in people processes where you can start working on these issues, but what it's really about is standardizing the criteria, making sure that they reflect what you really are trying to um, you know, sort of evaluate people on, that it reflects the values of your company, and that people are all aligned. You get a team together and they're like, we totally know what a top performer is, and they start talking, and it's like, mm -hmm. I mean, these, this is not, um, we don't have a meritocracy because I don't even think there's much consensus about what people are being judged on mm -hmm. um, to begin with. So um, the, the final thing I'll say is that um, these things are hard. It takes comprehensive <coughs> strategies. It takes a lot of people with expertise, a lot of um, trial and error on the ground figuring it out. And these partnerships between academics and practitioners, I think, can be really powerful. Um, and we don't really have a choice, because if you think about it, um, I, I love the demographics, because it just is what it is, but millennials are the largest and most diverse generation we've ever had in this country. Um, we can't afford to not have all of them um, employed and being used to their fullest capacities. So um, there's tremendous opportunity uh, to leverage what we have um, and a lot of, a, a big learning curve in how to operationalize what we know to be true already. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last but certainly not least, Hector. Hi, right, thank you. My name is Hector Bertran. I'm a PhD candidate here in social cultural anthropology. And I think my role here is to speak on behalf of people of color, which brings back memories and nightmares about my graduate courses where you have to discuss racism mm -hmm. in the room with white people. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try my best here. Um, I'm also the founder of the Latinos in Tech Initiative here at Berkeley. And I'll start um, with a real short personal narrative about why I'm here, why I think this is important. 
So I studied computer science undergrad. Um, after I graduated, I took on a tech consulting job, um, working around the country and the world in different industries. And I wound up on a project in Mexico City. And because of my bilingual skills, I had to be the translator between the Mexican workers and the US American consultants. Um, and I realized at that point that it was a lot more complicated than the technology. There was something about cultural changes. So I thought, you know what, I want to actually study culture. I had a yearning to go back to the more analytic world and study social sciences, humanities. So you know, at MIT, they, at least in the undergrad experience, they hammered down engineering and science, uh, going back to what Oscar said in the beginning. Um, parts, institutions have to prioritize certain elements of who they are, what they're doing at certain points. MIT, the top engineering school in the world, somehow humanities, arts, and social sciences get clumped into one department, and it's something you do um, after your engineering work. So I wound up back in uh, graduate school studying anthropology and realized that also culture, studying culture, studying sociocultural processes is a lot more complicated than you might think. It's not just people have different cultures and they clash, right? <laughs> so at the Latinos and Tech Initiative, we started with some big questions. Um, we did them off, how can classic and emerging social science methods and theor theoretical frameworks help us think critically about the complex processes that undergird the Silicon Valley? How can policy be derived and driven by critical scholarship on the, pra on the practices of the knowledge and informational technology economy? So, we started also exploring these themes more in depth in a class I taught last semester with undergrads. It's, on, it's in my GitHub repo. Uh, my handle is Teflon Beltron. And part of this is reading sociology, reading Bourdieu, reading Foucault, and trying to um, also read reports, industry reports. How do we converge these two, right? And one of the fruits of our initiative, so we tried, we had a conference last, conference last spring. Um, one of the things we try to do, very, very similar to the mission of this conference, is get industry folks together, get academic folks, folks together, and even more ambitious, try to get community workers and organizers involved in the conversation, right? Um, so we had a couple of panels, and we unpacked the business case for diversity. So what is a business case for diversity? We brought it up several times already here. What are the implications of starting out with the bottom line as a case for diversity? Um, unpacking the education to tech pipeline. Um, what does that mean? And you know, we'll throw some numbers out in the beginning just to get them out of the way because it's not all about numbers, as Jason was saying. 18% um, of computer science bachelor's degrees are held by black and Latino students who also only hold 5% of technical jobs who also only hold 1% of venture-backed tech company founder positions. And then the fruits of this conference are a policy brief that we're working on, or that I just sort of made a beta release on our website, go to latinosintech.edu. Um, I put it out there to uh, see what people think about it. Um, so please visit it. If you have any comments, let me know before we make the official release. And what did we focus on in this brief? So back to not just all about numbers, I wanted to focus on some of the main tensions that came up in this conference, in the different events we went to around the Bay Area discussing inclusivity in tech, diversity in tech. And we wanted to focus on these tensions, one, because I'm an anthropologist and I like to think about boundaries. Um, another is, as Aubrey mentioned with, with her white colleague that said, well, I've been on the wrong side of diversity all the time. Well, yeah, it's not just about taking positions, but sometimes when there's controversies, they um, cause for moments of reflection, of introspection, to think about what side do you want to be on and really question yourself and what you're doing in the work that you're, that you're doing. Um, also, not to get too academic, but one of my favorite anthropologists is Anna Singh, who talks about frictions. And she says there are these awkward, unequal, unstable, and creative qualities of interconnection across difference and the dualities and contradictions underlying these sticky engagements. So we feel this can uh, help orient us toward more critically informed policy. By the way, Anna Singh was going to give a lecture here at the end of the month, and her uh, lecture was canceled because of security issues around other talks um, to protect free speech. So that's a whole other conversation, um, especially with what's going on today. And uh, what I want to do is just highlight a couple. So we had a, 
eight of these productive tensions, right, in the policy report. And I want to just highlight two or three um, to get a sense of where we're going with it and what we talked about in, in this conference. So the first one um, we highlighted is helping your community versus being successful, with successful in quotes, right? So here's a quote from Jacob Martinez, who's the founder of Nest, a community organization in Watsonville that works with underrepresented students, introducing them to tech and entrepreneurship. If they are successful and they graduate college and they get a job in Silicon Valley working for a major tech company, hooray for them. But it doesn't do anything for our communities. So here the tension is, uh, this part of the pipeline problem is a very sort of mainstream narrative of what it means to be successful. You get your computer science degree, you join a major tech company, and all of a sudden you're not part of the pipeline problem, right? Well, what about students that decide they want to stay in the community, they want to develop programs, they don't want to use their CS degree or any other degree for that matter to join a major company? So that's just an invitation to rethink our measures of success, our metrics for measuring uh, representation, um, and think about the sort of sociocultural practices and historical processes that are responsible for issues of representation in the first place. So we end with a short little policy recommendation, right? So not that it's a checklist, but all right, where can we move uh, toward from this? And I say that the onus should not be on talented young people to have to decide between their community and their success. Tech companies should provide the time and resources for employees, especially people of color with insider knowledge, to connect with the community leaders doing this work and contribute their time and expertise to help develop these programs. Um, I'll throw out another tension. So I think Anu might like this one in terms of um, brain circulation and Aubrey on her frictions with the Hispanics in, in, in Sydney, right? So this one's called Latin Americans versus Latinos. So <laughs> in one of the conferences we went to, it was very clear, there was two panels. The first one that focused on US Latinos, we were bringing up these issues of diversity along the lines of what you're speaking on today. And then the next panel was about Latin American entrepreneurs, and it seems they completely ignored the other panel. We went back to a meritocratic uh, model where sort of the best wins. And it even became a thing where the Latin Americans were blaming the Latinos for not taking advantage of opportunities, not being entrepreneurial enough. This is kind of a worst case scenario for us, right? People put it against each other. There aren't enough opportunities. The creative types who happen to be the members of their countries that end up here um, blaming people of color here for not taking advantage of opportunity. And again, we highlight these, these tensions and differences because we feel like um, integrating social sciences, humanities, ethnic studies courses, um, Latino Studies 101 that's going to talk about transnationalism, hybrid identities, coalition building are crucial to um, addressing these issues and these tensions that might arise. Okay, so two of those, please look at the report, tell me what you think. Um, and finally, one of the tensions in the report itself, when I threw it around to people, was like, wait a minute, you're either, you're either going to distribute this to industry people or to academic, or to academic people. We, it's not going to make sense to one or the other. So again, issues of translation, and I refuse to make it for one or the other. I think that's the point, that there's a lack of communication between these different domains. Mm -hmm. And when I thought about, um, all right, am I going to be too obvious here? I'm, I'm an anthropologist. I'm going to talk about boundaries, privilege ethnography. I'm a person of color. I'm going to talk about ethnic studies being integrated into STEM curriculum. And then I thought about last summer, I worked at GitHub for the summer. And I interviewed um, open source developers. And if you want to geek out about people of color in relation to open source, collaboration, attribution, um, you can do that later. But the point was, when I was there, I saw uh, Nicole Sanchez, who was a VP of Social Impact, and we'll speak tomorrow. On her desk was a Gloria Ansaldúa book, pretty much the Bible of ethnic studies, Chicano studies. And I said, yeah, like this is, this is kind of where we should be going. People are reading different stuff. I know there's internal politics in GitHub, and I don't know if we'll get into that uh, during this conference. But I saw things there that I liked. And to end on a positive note, you know, they have a space at the bottom. This was GitHub last summer. And every, I saw one time where every hour they were letting uh, different communities come into the space and use it for different reasons. So like one hour is black folks doing things in tech. Another hour is Latino folks doing things in tech queer people doing things in tech. The next hour, you know, 
of uh, trans people and disabled people. And it came to the point where even the bathrooms, like the next hour, they would put gender neutral, like on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, these Silicon Valley people really take this fast-paced environment <laughs> and, uh, solving problems things seriously, right? <laughs> and it seems almost a little bit ridiculous to academics that do slow thinking and really think about things that take a long time. But I thought, no, maybe this is a good thing. This is about those frictions. You get people in the same space, mm -hmm. they're brushing up against each other, you force them to talk to each other, and <coughs> intersectional approaches and perspectives can emerge from this. Um, so I think for now I'll end, I'll end and I'll, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. I, I gotta thank all of you. This has been really one of the most amazing panels that I've <laughs> sat on. Really diverse set of um, inputs here. I'm gonna ask you each to answer one question and then I'm gonna open it up to you for questions. So the question I'm gonna ask is, one of the motivations for this um, conference was that our students, so I would say early in my tenure, everybody wanted, it was like going to Silicon Valley was the great thing and you know you had it made if you could get a job there from the School of Information. Um, over the past year and a half, I've heard a very different theme. I've heard them say, wow, that place is really reactionary. Yeah. That place is racist or it's misogynist or it's, you know, <laughs> Why would I want to go work there? What am I going to do with my future? I really, you know, so I just want to know, like, each of you, what would you say to my students? <laughs> just one word of advice. <laughs> That's harder than the qualifying exam question you asked me back in the day. Um, I know. <laughs> I, I will say that I went to MIT and never took an engineering class. Wow. Remarkable. <laughs> That's an achievement. It's, it's just shows that they're different worlds. Yeah. So is it a word of advice on, I'm sorry, I mean, no, to you. how to think about their careers in this world that they're yeah. seeing that looks not very inviting? Did you? You can kick us off. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think that we're living in fascinating times. I, yeah. I think that the, the nature of this work is, is inherently extremely challenging. All right? my, I, I make my living by having really difficult and uncomfortable conversations with people about things they feel like they shouldn't have to discuss at work. Uh, that, that challenges the core of who they believe themselves to be, that challenges their value systems, and it's never been more difficult for me than it is now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because I, when I, I moved from New York to California, uh, and Northern California being maybe the most incredibly progressive place in this country, but most interestingly, changing industries, right, moving from Wall Street and big banks uh, coming out into tech. So from one big industry to another big industry, but in so many ways, literally from the right to the left, <laughs> right? Uh, I ideologically, right? Uh, traditionally thinking about that. And so it's forced me to, to kind of think much more critically and differently about the way I'm approaching my own work. Um, so I, I'm, I'm navigating some of that, that tension myself um, on a day-to-day -day basis when I, I have to kind of reset expectations more frequently than I thought I would have to. Uh, and, and thinking that when I came to tech, I would find uh, people who are generally more open-minded or more open to discussion and debate or generally more aware of the world around them. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating because we, I, I, I don't know that I've ever worked with more like book smart and brilliant people who are, are building in incredible things and products and they're writing code and doing things that are far beyond my ability to grasp technically. But on the other end of it, it's humans that are using these products, right? <laughs> and so there, need, there needs to be like a fundamental appreciation for the fact that whatever it is that we're building in a vacuum and in a silo is going to be used by other human beings on the other end. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to share all the demographics with you for, for folks to, to know what the, the, the consequences are and how that translates mm -hmm. in the future. So what I would share with your students with all of that said is that um, I think that they have to, they have to be very critical. I think that I would encourage students to be critical, to continue to challenge and ask questions, to anchor in their values, but to be open-minded. Uh, I think that a school like, like UC Berkeley is probably one of the best places to be where you can practice that. But I would also encourage them to go out and seek opportunities to engage with people that are practicing in the areas that they have an interest or passion in. Mm -hmm. right? I think that that is a, a responsibility that anyone has. Uh, if you are interested in engineering, find a way to go connect with engineers that are doing the kind of work that you want. If you are interested in any other aspect of injury, uh, uh, industry or academia, um, go out and talk to people who are doing what you do. Right? The, the world has never been technically more open and connected than it is now in terms of access to information. The quality of that information uh, these days is, uh, 
this is uh, debatable, um, but I think that we have to go out and, and figure out what's, the, uh, what's that experience like. Try to get as much experience and, and as many perspectives as you can in the areas that you're interested in, in moving into, so you, you're going into something with your eyes open. Thank yeah. you, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I think I would just start off by saying that, especially when you're just starting out of college, that you should be the change that you're seeking. And so I think that um, covers come off the top of Silicon Valley, I think there's a lot, um, it's a lot worse than um, we maybe had hoped, and there's a lot of work to still be done. Um, but I'm not sure that the response is not to go into that, because then, um, yeah. you know, we need, um, we need to keep diversifying in all ways, and we need people who have um, very good intentions to go in and, and make a difference. Um, and I would say that Silicon Valley, though, isn't the only place that um, <laughs> makes big changes in the world and makes big differences in the world. And so um, there's a lot of different opportunities. You can go a, a, lot of, a lot of different ways. But I would also say that um, when you have a, a, a degree from a school like Berkeley, you are, a high, you, you are probably highly sought after in a lot of ways. And um, using that leverage to make um, stands for what the kinds of companies you want to work for. I, uh, recently, I, I write sometimes for The Atlantic, and I wrote an article about how tech is responding to the current political moment. And it occurred to me that um, should engineers choose to mobilize, they would be it would be like the largest labor rise up in the history of the world because they have so much power. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in a panel of CEOs who was like, don't, don't write that more. <laughs> um, and so I, I do see, um, you know, usually you think of, of, of you know, uh, uh, a workplace like, uh, like a labor relations issue around, you know, unions and things like that. But I do think that there's a degree to which people, all knowledge workers can use their skill sets that are in, in demand to demand sort of certain kinds of practices and ways of treating people and um, ways of being a company that we haven't really um, talked about and, and kind of um, sworn allegiance to, I guess is how I would describe it. So, um, you know, be the change you think, be the change you want to see and then do what you can to use the power you can to get people to act as ethically as possible. Great. I mean, I do think that Berkeley students don't understand the power of the degree. I mean, they sort of lost in the anxiety about finding a job. They don't realize sure. when they get out there, they yeah. actually can be very influential. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. great. Um, either of you, Joseph? But sure. I mean, I think I would echo what you said. Um, I think the situation is not as bad as students would think. Yeah. Um, it's it like, um, it never is, right? <laughs> It's like you're looking at merry-go-round going, you know, it's going so fast, it's like, oh, I can't get on it. But once you jump on it, it's not as scary as you thought it was going to be. Um, so I think that the speed at which these companies work, move, right, um, I don't think it's going to slow down. The speed is going to continue to, that's, that's the speed of technology, it's fast. Mm -hmm. um, but I think once you're in it, you don't really see it. You don't feel it as much as you feel it looking at it from outside. Um, that's one thing I would say. The second thing is what you, you mentioned, is that companies are very, um, they listen to their employees. And they're trying to attract the best talent. So they are constantly changing and accommodating what the this, this students are looking for. Um, and so I think it's important to voice what you're looking for, because um, as the, that adds up, companies will listen and they will make adjustments. Um, so that's what I would advise. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, so A, I would say, going back to the model of neoliberal anxious student that wants to make a decision, just <laughs> choose something and you're going to be fine. And to yeah. and it connects to what I'm going to say in response to Joseph, once you're in it, you don't really see what you're doing. So I would tell them to do an exercise that one of my education professors has me do, and now I have my students do, which is at the beginning of the course, you know, take a moment to write down why are you here, why are you in the university, why are you doing this course, and then at the end of the class, bring it out and see how you relate to yourself, you know, uh, four months ago. Same thing with the job. Write down why you're in that company, what you want to do there, and then once you become institutionalized in the practices and somehow you're regurgitating narratives of the good coder versus the bad coder, the good immigrant versus the bad immigrant, go back to your paper and realize that you were critiquing that nine months ago at UC Berkeley and why is it that you changed and maybe made some changes to um, steer in different directions. Great, thanks all of you. Um, questions in the audience? We've got a great panel here.
Hi. Um, ooh, it's loud. <laughs> Sorry. I wasn't expecting that. Um, so my question is about these uh, tensions that you brought up in your policy report, which I plan to read. Um, but I think another tension that I see a lot coming up is this idea of, you know, people of color who are in tech because there are so few of us that they, we kind of get pulled to do a whole bunch of additional emotional labor, whether that's mentoring and yeah. like I myself, I'm a faculty member and as soon as I got hired, I thought, okay, am I or am I not gonna serve on the DEI committee, right? Because I don't want to, because I do that labor all the time, but at the same time, I feel like, you know, am I responsible to give back to my community? So I feel like there's this tension between giving back to your community, but also, you know, making sure that you're not kind of over, overburdened at the expense of your own kind of self-care and progress and all of those things. So just, it's really for anybody, just any, if you see that tension yourself and what your opinions are. Yeah, so Ian, thanks for the comment and goes back to one of the parallels with the university and other spaces where um, people of color are underrepresented, women are underrepresented and they're expected to do this, all this extra labor. And I can just think about um, one thing that came up in the GitHub gig where it was, they have the graphs that measure how much coding, how, how much you commit how, much, how, how many commits you have in your code, right? And it shows that you're productive, and in a sense, that's how you get uh, interviews, that's how you get jobs. And of course, a lot of women especially would bring up that, hey, what about the mentoring I do behind the scenes? What about the emotional labor that gets put into these coders having the space and the privilege to just work on their code all the time, right? So just, just a comment to uh, resonate what you're, what you're bringing up. I, I, I'll add, I, I think that it's a great call out because there, there's a real cost, right, for underrepresented people in, in any industry, but definitely working in tech, where there is almost this expectation, right, that you will avail yourself uh, to others uh, as a, a resource, as a mentor, as a, a coffee person. Um, and, and sometimes it's just kind of a, an unspoken kind of social expectation. And at other times, it, it becomes somewhat of a formal expectation where you realize you're getting added to every loop, interview loop, where there's a black person uh, that's coming in, or every time someone has a question about diversity efforts, you're the one person they go to to talk about what it is that the team is working on. Um, so that, that's real, and it can contribute to people's burnout, right? Uh, and, and, and the self-care component is so critical. Uh, that's why you know, I think it, it's so key to build community. Critical mass is critical for a reason. Right, because you can't just keep going to the same individuals over and over again to be a source of support. Because who's going to be there to support them? At Pinterest, one of the things I think that we do quite well is we try to create a community of communities internally. We have resource groups. We call them um, employee communities. And there's a tremendous amount of diversity that cuts across all of these groups. So we have a group for black employees at Pinterest, but over 25% of the members in that group they're not black employees. They don't identify as black or African American. So what we're trying to really focus on is being really intentional in, in broadcasting that all of our communities are open, inclusive. We are actively seeking out people to engage, to learn, to build some bridges, to increase the amount of support that people can, can share and find that, that is available to them. But I will also say, you know, I, I've seen, especially earlier in my career, uh, on the banking side, where you know I would meet the occasional underrepresented banker who would become a managing director and came up in a time where there was no one like him or her, no one like them, and they didn't have that same sense of obligation, right, to reach back and help others that look like them. They had to pay dues in a way that no one else had to. They had to uh, endure challenges and hardship professionally. They had to make sacrifices and compromises that. Uh, they feel others now no longer have to make. That, I believe, is a more difficult tension to manage uh, because you can't thrust your own value system uh, on others who you feel are in a position to reach back and help. So I don't know uh, how to, how to na navigate that tension exactly, but I've experienced both aspects of it. The, the answer for me is I think you try to build as broad a community as possible for folks. But I would wonder if, um, if the tension is external or internal. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think sometimes it's the pressure you put on yourself rather than somebody else putting that pressure on you. Mm. You feel like, I have to do this. Kind of ob I feel I'm obligated to, I got to do this. I have to help out. And women and underrepresented minority um, particularly um, tend to do that. Yes. And, and sometimes that could 
could really um, uh, could play against you in how you're trying to progress because you're spending so much time on this and you're not spending as much in your actual work. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something that you really one, one has to check. You've got to check yourself and make sure that you're not, because you have to do your job first, mm -hmm. right? There is a job you are hired to do, you got to do that job before you do something else. It is the responsibility of DNI uh, organization to put these mechanisms in place to support the to support the employees. Um, you can tap the employee resource group, as you pointed out. Uh, we have those as well. But it really, I think, we need to put the, uh, the onus on the DNI, not on the individual members uh, of the group which you're trying to help, right? Because it, that's that's not fair. It's unfair to them uh, to do that. Um, we, uh, an example I can give you, it's what we did at Intel, is we established what we call the warm line. So it's an organization that anybody can call into that yeah. and, and get help, any help. It could be uh, um, you feel like maybe you are not, you're not moving as fast as you should, um, or you feel like you don't have uh, mentors as, you know, to help you progress. Uh, you, could have, you could call them because I, you know, my manager isn't working out. Anything, and it's it's a uh, uh, it's confidential, it's and there are counselors that would help you, and that's their job. Mm -hmm. um, and so that whole thing is to really try to make sure that um, women and underrepresented minority uh, employees don't shoulder all the uh, all the mentoring and the helping yeah. of others. Yeah, and I just to close it out yeah. is um, an organizations need to put make sure that their white dudes are also involved in all of this stuff. <laughs> because the, the research also shows is that when women and other minorities do this work, they get pushback, and it, 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 personal pushback. It can yeah. um, slow down their career uh, progress. And so you need to, the people who have the most power in an organization should mm -hmm. also be the ones who are put on this problem. Otherwise, it's not, there's no real believe, reason to believe that the leadership sees it as a problem. Yep. Yeah. Very, so. I agree. Great, great set of answers. OK, other questions? Yes? Um, so first of all, let me thank all the panelists. I thought all of your comments were really good. Uh, the question is directed, at, I believe, to Marianne, and uh, it has to do with the comment you made about trying to avoid ambiguous criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, ambiguous criteria, and this is especially true in my experience uh, in jobs where they're very research oriented, and probably no more so than, than in the academy, mm. where be phenomenal might very well be a job description for like most of the faculty <laughs> decisions I've seen. I've, no, I've, applied, I've applied for a few of those. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't get them. So I'm just wondering if you could maybe give us some thoughts or advice on, on how exactly one goes about trying to pin down those criteria, because that really is something that, that makes it very difficult to bring in candidates that don't. Uh, adhere to a very strict set of um, preconceived notions of what phenomenal is. Yeah, so the, there's it's probably a multi-step process, but what um, the research has shown is that when people agree in advance on the criteria, then they tend not to shift the criteria around. What can often happen for minorities or others is that like an additional criteria is added in. So a colleague of mine was talking about they were doing a faculty search for a junior hire and they gotten through a few applicants and then the first woman candidate came up and a senior faculty member said, well, her teaching evaluations aren't very good. And so my colleague said, all right, then we, that's fine if that's a criteria, but we need to go back and look at all the other applicants mm -hmm. and make sure we're looking at their teaching evaluations. Mm -hmm. But the, the ideal model is that that's all sussed out before. Yep. So teaching evaluations are gonna account for this much and you know whatever that list of 10 or 20 things um, mm -hmm. is, and not just the list, but that your understanding of what each of those things on the list means and looks like. Um, and then that way, and then you can have a person in the room who's, who's the criteria monitor, and you can trade that role because it can be hard, but they can say, you know, that, that's not a criteria that we'd agreed to. We can mm -hmm. add it to the list if everyone thinks that's important, but we've got to go back through all the applicants. Mm -hmm. um, and then even for the subtle dynamics, like there was recent research, it wasn't it? Uh, Berkeley or San Diego was looking at uh, women uh, uh, applying for engineering professor jobs, and they were interrupted in the, in, more during their talk. Mm -hmm. So I would even try to, to, to the degree that you can, um, 
you know, block bias in those kinds of interactions. We're going to let the candidate talk from this time. We're going to only ask this many questions. We're not, you know, so, so you're trying to block it from happening in real time as well. So that's, that's where I'd start. That's helpful. Thank you. So I'd uh, <clears throat> like to know, are you aware of any research that addresses the role of leadership in addressing diversity and inclusion in tech? And secondly, what are some of the opportunities that exist with respect to the role of leadership in addressing diversity and inclusion in tech? Mm -hmm. Um, Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can tell you. So I work on a, a Lean In and McKinsey partner on a Women in the Workplace report, and there's a lot of companies there, a lot of survey data. Um, and I can tell you one of the biggest things that always jumps out at me is that there's what companies think they're doing and what employees see they're doing or experience, and it's like the two do not always line up. And so um, I think there's a, a real I think when a leader talks about being committed to diversity, if there's no, if, if employees have no idea how you would execute on that, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've been in a lot of meetings where the CEO will be really supportive of diversity, will have like publicly stated things, written things, but their, their t senior management and the middle management have zero <laughs> idea what they would actually do to advocate for women or support an underrepresented mm -hmm. minority. Like the actual how-tos, like, from you know, creating a hiring criteria list or something like that, like the really the practical mechanics of it is is unclear. Mm -hmm. um, but when I think when when women feel or when underrepresented minorities feel that leadership is committed, it, it's helpful. But if it's not actually translating into day to day actions that they can see, <coughs> then it becomes meaningless. Any other nonsense? I'd, I'd agree, and, and actually, I, I think it's really critical to have that the leadership commitment. Um, not only in words, but in action as well. Uh, because the lack of that will make it impossible for you to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, it is hard as it is. If you don't have that kind of support from the top, it's almost impossible to do. Um, our experience at Intel, for instance, is we are lucky because we had a CEO who was really committed to this. Um, not only by providing the resource to do the work, but it actually holds us all accountable mm -hmm. for the work. Diversity is part of our, our yearly bonus. Mm -hmm. It fixes into mm -hmm. this. So every employee is actually affected by how well we are doing mm -hmm. towards hitting our diversity um, objectives. Mm -hmm. So I think that having those kind of uh, um, real action mm -hmm. translate, it actually conveys that you really are serious mm -hmm. about this. Yeah. And you you see it as something of important, yeah. of importance that you want to kind of treat it as the same way we treat like a, uh, how much money we're making every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that that without that kind of commitment, I don't see how how you would actually be able to move the needle at all no. within the company. I think that's one of the problems we have in the university is that there is a commitment to it, mm -hmm. but when push comes to shove, nobody enforces it. Yeah, so. the, the accountability piece is, is huge, and I'm glad that you brought that up because I, there is a, I can't remember all the specific points, but there's a research uh, study that was published by EY not long ago that might be helpful for you where they were looking at a cohort of companies across seven industries, specifically at leadership and, and measuring uh, their progress against goals and achieving gender parity. <clears throat> and what was really interesting about that study and what they uncovered was that there is a significant disconnect, as you had mentioned, uh, between the perception and reality of the progress that their companies were making. Right? The, the CEOs and the leadership of many of these companies were overestimating how well that they were doing. Many of them didn't have effective or accurate mechanisms in place to actually track and measure progress when it came to things like representation. Many didn't even have hiring goals in place. Right? And so they may see activities happening with employer resource groups. You may have a chief diversity officer out on the circuit speaking and showing up. You may apply for an award and win an employer of choice award for one of these companies. But that's not a true indicator of whether or not you're achieving real progress and parity internally. Right? And so in the absence of accountability, which I suspect many of those companies do have, the, need, the needle just doesn't move. 
Uh, compensation is a great way uh, that I think you can, you can tie back into it. Uh, Pinterest, our hiring goals are public. We publish those publicly. Mm -hmm. Very, very few companies actually publish what their, their hiring goals are for women and underrepresented um, ethnic minorities in either engineering or just broader business roles. So that was you know, a, a line in the sand that we drew to say, you know what, if we don't measure this, um, and, and we don't get the public to hold our feet to the fire, we're probably not gonna move the needle in the way that we do. So what gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were able to move in one year from publishing our goals publicly, we're able to increase representation for women in all tech roles from 21% to almost 27% one year. Mm -hmm. for, for underrepresented groups, it went from 2% to almost 9% in one year, right? So again, once it gets measured, once you have that accountability in place, that's how you move it. Is there one more question? One final question. No more questions. Excellent. This has been a great panel. We have a break now, so thanks to all the panelists thank for you. a great conversation. Yeah.